at different points in our life, I think we have these signposts type moments uh, that are just trying to tell us something. And for most of us, these signposts are not clear at the time, and um, perspective is really 2020. When I was in second or third grade, um, I don't even remember the exact year, it gets a little foggy, but it was the late 80s, and um, I was jealous of the girls with the teased out bangs. And then some of the girls had these large buttons that they put on their denim jacket or on their backpack. They were size of dinner plates. They were quite large. Um, and they usually uh, showcased their favorite artists, such as New Kids on the Block or the fabulous Paula Abdul. Um, her uh, hit song at the moment was Opposites Attract. And there was an event going on at our school, and the girls in my class, we had put a dance number together to that song. And during uh, the school day, we were able to show our really awesome third grade dance moves to everyone in our class. Um, and we were pretty impressed with ourselves. Um, however, by the time I got home from school that day, the principal had already called to let my parents know that they were taking the performance out of the evening's um, events. Uh, something about Paula Abdul's animated wolf boyfriend stealing the covers in bed and liking the smell of cigarette smoke did not work with Holy Name Elementary School <laughs> performance. My dreams of a backup dancer with tease bangs were shattered that day. And uh, I didn't understand that signpost in my life, but now to a mother of an eight-year-old daughter who's about to have her third grade talent show, I completely understand that principal's phone call. As a reader, we have perspective, and when we read through the stories of the Bible, we are now able to see the bigger picture. And just like the people of the Bible, they didn't have the luxury of that, of knowing what is coming down the road. The Old Testament to me, it is a story after story of people just being human. And they're choosing to lead their lives how they wanted at times, rather than uh, listening to God's signposts that he offered along the way. We immediately start the Bible. You're familiar with Adam and Eve. They just wanted this all-knowing piece of fruit. And then it, the, a flood wiped out the world's population at one time because of people's incredibly poor decisions, followed up by Abraham lying who he really is, Joseph's brother selling him into slavery, Moses leading his people out of Egypt only for them to complain and create their own idols, and many many more stories of people choosing to do life on their own terms. It doesn't always go so well. And unfortunately, like most people, warning is not enough. For us, um, sometimes it is this disastrous cycle that replays itself over and over. And just like in the New Testament, I think if we're honest with ourselves, it probably has happened a little bit with us too. So today I wanted to focus in on a portion of the Old Testament. It's in 1 Samuel. And for a time, God's people, they sought out judges instead of a king to rule and bring order to their land. And Samuel, he was one of these last judges, and he was wise. And he understood that choosing not to go along with God's plan can bring its share of heartbreaks. Israel, they lived in a time of fear and conflict because of the constant attack of the Philistine army. Scared about what would happen in an upcoming battle, the Israelites, they decided to beg Samuel to pray to God for them. And during that time, God's own people had strayed away, turning to their own idols. Samuel was honest with them. He said, you know what, you've got to get rid of all of that garbage and you need to devote yourself to God. Just come back to him. So they chose to listen to Samuel, and in 1 Samuel 7, it says this. As Samuel was performing the sacrifice, the voice of the Eternal rolled like thunder, and it confused the advancing Philistine army so that Israel easily struck them down. By turning to God in that moment, even though they had messed up, and this wasn't the first or the last time. The Israelite cycle was restarted yet again. So in verse 12, 
it goes on to say this, that's why Samuel set up a stone between Mizpah and Shen, and he called that stone Ebenezer, which means rock of help. For he said, the eternal one has helped us so far. To be perfectly honest, the first time I read this, I uh, just saw the word Ebenezer, and I thought, how did Ebenezer Scrooge get into the Bible, okay? <sighs> I just imagined him screaming at Bob Cratchit. I didn't, I didn't understand. But ultimately, Ebenezer is a Hebrew word, and it simpli- simply means rock or stone of help. This monumental stone that Samuel set up signifies the great help that God granted to his people. It's kind of like a signpost, right? I feel pretty confident when people were traveling back then, they didn't have a lot of street signs or ways to tell them their next direction. They relied on the stars at night and most likely points of interest uh, like monuments and landscapes during the day to tell them where they needed to travel. It's kind of like going to that one relative's house and maybe you went there this um, Thanksgiving. You know how to get there based off that one weird mailbox or that odd fork in the road, or that house that somehow they decided to paint neon green. I just kind of wonder. There's something familiar about it, that we seem to know exactly where we are. For the Israelites, these monuments of stone set out in certain places. They had deep meaning. And many stories were passed along through spoken word. So every time people passed this Ebenezer, They were reminded of the time God rolled in like thunder, and it allowed the Israelites to conquer yet again. God was their rock of help during that time. I have read this passage over and over the past couple of months, but just last week that I actually see this part of the verse. And that's something I encourage you to do. If you keep rereading a verse over the course of your life, there's little nuggets that you're going to pull out from time to time. So this is the part of the verse I notice. The eternal one has helped us so far. So far? Like I said, the Bible is a series of people messing up over and over again. Now, I'm sure that God had planned this all along. He already knew exactly how this was going to play out. But how is anyone going to stop the cycle and be good enough to eventually enter into heaven? so far can only take you to a certain point. And that's why there's this foreshadowing of Christ throughout the whole Old Testament. Maybe we don't notice it right away, but that a Savior is coming who will truly be a stone of help and will go beyond so far and lead all of us into, the, into eternity if we choose to accept it. Greg, he briefly talked about Jesus being a carpenter last week, and I got a little worried he was going to steal my thunder uh, because I have been really excited to share this next idea with you. For most of us, uh, if you grew up Christian or not, you kind of knew that Jesus, his profession was, does anyone know what his profession was? Carpenter, okay. Because whenever I watched uh, a biblical movie or read a book, it was just Jesus playing in a way like some kind of table. Uh, But I recently listened to a podcast that changed my mind. In ancient Greek, the biblical translation of our word carpenter is the word tekton. It means an artisan or craftsman. And for us, it is really easy to Americanize the things based on what we know. So when we hear craftsman, I, I directly go to carpenter. However, the landscape that Jesus lived in, there was no buildable wood. It was very sparse. Uh, Where Jesus lived, there was only a few types of different trees, olive, fig, and balsam. I am no carpenter, but I am pretty confident you are not making a kitchen table out of an olive branch, okay? The cedars of Lebanon, they were these giant trees where wood came from, but they were, and they're very sturdy, you could have made a table out of that, but they were hundreds of miles away, and I'm pretty sure they did not have Home Depot delivery service back then. So these giant logs, I mean, you needed a lot of money to make something out of cedar. A Hebraic scholar, James W. Fleming, he studied the majority of homes in Israel, and there is a picture that is, it's constructed with stone. 
So based on that, experts think that Jesus was most likely a stonemason. Jesus would have made most of his projects by carving or chiseling stackable stones. And these are the types of things I love finding out because it's because I become like some biblical CSI. And these concepts and passages that Jesus said, now they, they just change that whole context. And I see them in a different way, kind of like all these passages I'm going to read that Jesus said. Upon this rock... I will build my church. The stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. You who are without sin cast the first stone. Papa was a rolling stone from the book of temptations. (laughs) That was the only one that just kept going in my head this week, and I'm like, I just need to put that in there. All right, these pieces, as you can see, they can help shape our view of the Bible and into one seamless story. And you can see that thread of Jesus, he's just weaving himself in and out of the Bible. And so now with that nugget of information, that kind of just opens the door and changes the way we view 1 Samuel, what we just read. He set up a stone between Mizpah and Shen, And he called that stone Ebenezer, which means rock of help. Whether Jesus was a stonemason or a carpenter, either one, it doesn't change who Jesus truly is. It just opens the door in understanding that he is our rock of help. We will just have to find out if the gates of heaven, though, when we get there, they're going to be made out of uh, stone or wood. We'll just find out. Uh, This summer, we took our family road trip to Nashville, but on the way, we stopped at the Louisville Slugger Museum, and in the back of the museum, there was this giant stone baseball glove uh, entitled Play Ball, and it took two stone artisans almost two years to sculpt a piece of 450 million-year-old Kentucky limestone. It is large enough that you can crawl through it, And uh, when it was delivered, they needed to take off all the front doors of the museum in order to get the 17-ton piece into the building. A stonemason, they take rough pieces of rock and they shape them to create a work of art. They take great pride in producing beautiful yet functional work that is unique to each client. And I just imagine that That is how God views us, too. We're just a roughed-up piece of stone, and over time, it's shaping us into a work of art. At the end of our life, he has shaped us into something beautiful and unique. And our lives, they're going to be far from perfect, but it will always be a battle for us, just trying not to do life on our own. Sometimes we're just so busy looking forward what's coming that we forget about where our lives have taken us. So this week, I encourage you to spend some time, not just a few minutes, like some serious time. Maybe it's all the time you're uh, driving into work, thinking about those moments in your life, really reflecting on those past signposts, those that have brought you great joy or true hardship. Can you just place a mental Ebenezer there for a moment? to see how God has helped you during that time and he's provided a way out of it. And with that perspective, we can see how God, he was just molding our lives. Some signposts are bigger ones and other ones seem a little bit more mundane. For me, um, last May, I got strep throat. Awesome. Um, recovered, and then again in June. I breezed through July just fine, but it came back again in August, and then one more time in September. And nobody wanted those tonsils more out than myself, Um, but an adult tonsillectomy, it just really didn't line up with my life plans. Um, I'm not recommending this as elective surgery by any means. Um, The perks of ice cream and days in bed are highly overrated. My favorite things in life um, are just doing things by myself, just getting things done, talking, and eating, okay? 
Both, all of them, have just become very limited during that time. And the ice pebbles from Sonic became my new best friend. But they did little to subside the hunger that I had for thin crust pizza, nachos, and deep fried cheese curds. As each day passed, I love to be able to do things on my own. So it's funny how during that time, I had to ask for help, which I hate doing, from others and have people bring me things. They had to watch my kids so I could rest, help with dinner, um, and just not do anything. I just had to wait to heal. My Ebenezer at that moment was very subtle, but I learned to let go a few things. And I realized that everything still goes on fine just without me. I'm re in reality, I'm not that big of a deal. And he is the one that was ultimately going to help me see that. So, what is your Ebenezer? Your signpost in life where you have seen God help you? How has he taught you? And have you chosen to share that with anyone? Because when we are able to share that with other people, maybe in a community group or with another friend, that is when transformation can start within ourselves and in other people. We are only able to go so far by ourselves. It is when we choose to have a relationship with him that even when our world is confusing, it's mundane, or it's challenging, we can have that constant rock to look to and know that he will help us in his own way. There are some familiar hymns that maybe you have grown up with, and at times we can sing them by heart without truly listening or connecting the actual meaning of the song. Come thou fount of every blessing, it was written in the 18th century by the 22-year-old Robert Robinson. His lyrics, it dwells on the theme of God's divine grace that he took from that story in 1 Samuel that we read about today. You may have heard the word Ebenezer in this song as well, and Robinson followed it with the phrase, Here by the great help I've come. So to all who sing this song, he wants them to acknowledge God's tremendous blessings and help in their lives. Let me tell you, it's far better when we do life with him. But to be perfectly honest, I'm probably going to mess this up by this afternoon. It is a slow process of seeing those signposts from him along the way. We need to be aware of the blessing of God's help in our lives and just try to live our life a little better than we did yesterday. Let me end with what our God says to us in Isaiah 28. It's something that we can hold on to, that we can trust, and that we can believe in. He says this, I am laying a firm foundation for the city of Zion. It is a valuable cornerstone, proven to be trustworthy. No one who trusts it will ever be disappointed.